Matthew 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me. This is all together. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm saying this to you tonight. Uh, actually, I'm going to give you a title, if that's all right. The Blockages that hinder relationship and effective ministry. That's a little long and cumbersome sounding. It doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But wait, till, just give me a couple of minutes. Give the Holy Ghost a couple of minutes, and let's see how exciting that is. The, the, the thing that's really important for you to see in the verses I've just read is this. You getting to know God is important to God. It's His idea. He wants you to get to know Him. He wants to have a relationship with you. But here's what these verses is essentially what these verses are essentially saying. They are essentially saying, "I want to have a relationship with you, and I want you to get to know me." However, there are certain hindrances that are in your life that are preventing you from really being able to know me. It is not hard to know Jesus. In order to not know Jesus, to not have a relationship with God, to not be able to talk to God and Him talk back to you, or Him talk to you and you talk back to Him, to, to, in order to be able to read the Bible, to understand what it says, it's not hard. And if it's not happening for you, there's a reason. Or there, are may, there may be more than one reason. So if you don't know God, that's not because He's unwilling for you to know Him. If you pray and nothing happens when you pray, that's not because he's unwilling to answer prayers. When, when these things don't work, there's always a reason. There's always a reason. And if I deal with the reason and get them out of the way, then the hindrances to my relationship with him are moved. And the things that are hindering my, the effectiveness of my ministry in him is, are removed. Now, it, let me say this right now. We say, well, I'm in, not in the ministry. Then you don't believe the Bible. Because the scripture teaches the priesthood of all believers. The same Holy Ghost I have is the same Holy Ghost you have. Your Holy Ghost is not different than my Holy Ghost. Those that aren't called to preach the word aren't given a different Holy Ghost. They're not given a different Holy Ghost. It's the same Holy Ghost. And the same Holy Ghost uses us in whatever giftings and ministry that God has determined for us to be used of Him in. So if my prayer is not working, there's a reason. It's not a mystery. There are reasons. If my, if my ministry's not working, there's a reason. And I don't care how talented, it, 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 and we, what talent that God's blessed this church with. Amen. What talent? But I don't care how talented you are. Without the Holy Ghost using that talent, you're just performing, and there's no flow, there's no ministry that takes place. Performance is for the purpose of gaining accolades, for the one performing. But ministry is for the purpose of gaining accolades for the one who died for us. Amen. So, he says, come unto me all you labor heavy laden and I'll give you rest. 
The Greek word there for rest means cessation from all labor. But then he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. That second word rest is a different Greek word. It doesn't mean cessation from all labor. It means rest in your labor. Why? Because I'm yoked up with Him. And now whatever's being done, He's doing it through me. Because I'm now, I've gotten the, the or by His grace, I've gotten the hindrances out of the way. So that He now can work through me. The Lord wants you to have faith more than you could ever possibly want to have faith. It was His idea. Then why is it your faith working? Why do you battle fear? Why are you tormented at times? Why is it you don't have peace all the time, no matter what's happening? There's a reason. There are reasons for these things because there are things He's promised us and those things work. And if they're not working, it's not His failure. It's that there are things in us either that we're not aware of or that we don't think are that big a deal and so we don't deal with them. And those things keep these from working. And if by the grace of God I deal with these things that hinder my relationship with Him and therefore hinder Him being able to use me in His will and His purpose, when those things are removed, my prayers will work, my faith works, my relationship grows, and my ministry is effective. And look, some of you look and say, looking at me going, it's not that simple. The problem is, it's more simple than I can possibly make it. It is that simple. Oh, but oh, I know. I didn't say easy. I said simple. In fact, the problem is this. Neither you nor I have the capability of dealing with these hindrances by ourselves. In order for them to be removed, I have to let him help me with them. I have to let him deliver me from them. I have to let him empower me to be able to remove them. One said tonight, this has been a terrible year. Well, <laughs> it is possible to reach a place in God. There's no such thing as a terrible year. Because my God never allows anything to happen that's not for the purpose of, first of all, being glorified Himself, the edification of His kingdom, and in order for both of those things to take place, my growth in Him. Because I have to, that's the last words of the Apostle Peter, 2 Peter 3.18. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Right? So here's the deal. If I, if I don't let Him do that through me, then how, how, how am I going to get there? No, it's not easy. In fact, it's impossible. Understanding the problem is simple. Okay, so... You got a lump. You go to the doctor and the doctor says, this is, this, this is what this is. And they, they run the test. They say, this is what it is. That's simple. This is the problem. That doesn't mean it's simple dealing with the problem. But the impossibility of dealing with the hindrances that keeps my relationship from growing are for the purpose of me having to completely rely upon Him to address them. Because I cannot do it myself. Well, here's the problem. And we, it's this stuff, this, is, this stuff is something else. Thank God there's less of it than there used to be. But this stuff is, 
This is, there's nothing like this stuff in the earth. You know, the, the devil can't, he can't even conceive of this stuff. He didn't have flesh. A spirit, Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And angels, whether God's angels or the fallen ones, they are spirit beings. They don't have flesh. They don't have a clue what it's like to have flesh. Now, flesh isn't an excuse, but the reason Satan was one and done and there was no forgiveness and no redemption, because he didn't have flesh. The reason that God is so patient with us is because we've got flesh. But here's the deal. We've been given flesh to teach us that only He can get it done through us because it's impossible for flesh to do it. I'm trying hard. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the word, the other day I was praying, the word temperance came through my mind. And I, 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 I preached from the, it's one of the, the nine fruit of the Spirit, temperance. And the word temperance is used in several different places. And I looked up the Greek word and it means self-control. Uh, wait a minute. So God was talking about self-controlling self. How's that working? Well, brother, right? You must have found some self-control. You've lost weight. Ha <laughs> ha, that's exactly the lie. I didn't do this. I can tell you the date and the time and the place when I felt the grace of God do something in me that had, ne had not been done before. And I, I, think, I give thanks for 61 pounds gone. But I can't take credit for any of it because the will to do it and the ability to do that is not mine. It's not mine. It's the grace of God. I didn't do this. Now, some of you sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you believe what you want to believe. I know. I know. <laughs> like I said, some of you may never, may not, not have been around long enough to remember, remember me a lot slimmer even than this. I weighed 195 pounds when I came to town. That's a long time ago. But you know the problem? I prayed about this a lot. I said, Lord, you know, I, I can't do this myself. I can't lose this weight myself. So... Either you give me the ability to do this or you're going to have to help me make peace in here because I can't get away from this skinny guy I see in here. I can't get away from him. I'm trying to talk to you now. Okay? I said it. I, I prayed about it a lot of times. Lord, I can't do this. I've tried. And I may do it for a few days or weeks, even a month or two. But I always go back because I'm doing it myself. I can't do this. So if, if you're not going to help me do this, give me peace like I am. You've heard me tell the story, but years ago, I, I'd put on some weight. And I, when I first had really started putting on some weight, I said to my wife, does it bother you that I'm overweight? She said, no, I just don't want you to get bald. I said, well, thank you very much, because I have no control over that. I can lose the weight somehow, by the grace of God. I can lose the weight. I can't put the hair back. I'm there. I remember years ago when I had a full head of hair, I was sitting talking, sitting at a table with some folks, and uh, there's a guy there that I, it was, we were in another town, and the guy I'd known a long time, and he was a good guy, but I, and I felt comfortable enough doing this, but he was balding in the front and the back. I said, I called his name, I said, hey man, uh, did you know that if a man is losing weight, 
in the back, he's a thinker. And if he's losing weight in the front, he's a lover. And if he's losing place, hair in both places, he thinks he's a lover. <laughs> I remember telling him that story. I remember telling him that story. And when I started losing it, I remember telling him that and thinking to myself, I wish I would have kept my mouth shut. Because I'm losing it front and back too. So the, the point here is, it's simple to know what the diagnosis is. But the cure is not simple. In fact, it's impossible because you can't fix yourself. And when flesh, allied with human will, decides it's going to change so that it can take the credit, it's only a matter of time. It may be days, weeks, months, years, but you will fail. You will fail. You will fail. You will fail. And you know why God lets all of us fail? Well, I, I haven't failed. You're lying. You're lying. You're lying. Why? Why does God let everybody fail? So you can't point fingers at somebody else and say, you failed, but I never have. You've hurt me, but I've never hurt anybody. Liar. Liar. And what's really bad is when you've hurt people and you're not even aware you've hurt them or are willing to acknowledge you've hurt them. So you can play the victim. Because I can't play the victim if I am in denial over what I've done to others. And so, just for a few moments, and if you were guessing, you could probably, probably guess what the four primary blockages are. The first one is unrepented sins. I didn't say sin. Somebody's got to get this in their head tonight. It's not sin that blocks us from God. It's unrepented sin. Isaiah 59 verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. What iniquities and sins? Those that haven't been repented for. 1 John chapter 1 verse 5. 1 John 1 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him. And walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his son. Cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. So therefore, it's not sin that separates us from God. It's unacknowledged sin that we won't repent of, that we won't confess. That's not a license to sin, you understand. But Paul said it. The things I would do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. To will is present with me. But how to, how to do what I will, I find not. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There's not one person in this room, especially the one holding this microphone, that's ever made it through a full day without offending the Word of God somehow. Because you see, the problem we have is this. We use, we use the world's definition of sin. It's doing something we shouldn't do. But I've said it many times, and I will say it again tonight. The greatest sins that Christians commit are the sins of omission. The things we should do that we don't do. 
If you're the most moral person in this world, but you're not humble enough to pray to God faithfully every day, you are a sinner. You're a sinner. So, the first place you look if prayer's not working, the first place that, work, that, that you look if your relationship with God is stagnant or worse, the first place you look if your ministry's not effective, you can't feel the flow, you can't do that, the first place you look is yourself. Lord, talk to me. Reveal the truth to me. Let me see me like you see me. Let me see the way I'm living. Let me see my attitudes the way that, I, that you see me. You know what? The world has become professionals at using the V card, the victim card, to justify all kinds of wrong things. I haven't done wrong, I'm a victim. I haven't done wrong, I'm a victim. Yeah, you're a victim. A victim of your own flesh. A victim of your own will. A victim of your own stubbornness. A victim of your past that you won't let God help you past. Getting forgiven is easy. It really is. I've said this before. God is the fastest forgiver in the West. It, you, don't have to, you don't have to promise him stuff. Lord, if you'll forgive me, I won't ever do that again. Liar. You can't tell him that. It's a lie. He doesn't negotiate. You can't make a deal with him. He's already paid the price for your forgiveness. He's already shed the blood. I just have to be humble enough to acknowledge what I've done is wrong and ask his forgiveness and I will get it. But that leads us into the next one. Matthew chapter 6 verses 14 and 15 says... For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And notice please in these verses, there's no yeah buts. Yeah, but you know what they, God, you know what they did to me. Yeah, yeah, okay, Lord, I see that, but that doesn't fit my case because you, you don't know how I've been treated. There's no yeah buts in this. Why? How can I ask for forgiveness when I don't deserve it without being willing to give the same? How many times when you come to the Lord and said, Lord, forgive me, He said, I I'm, I'm going to try to. But it's going to take me a little while to get over the way you've treated me. Anybody ever had him say that to you? Hello? Hello? I'm asking a question in the Holy Ghost. How many times have you ever come to God and asked him for his forgiveness? He said, well, I'll try. It may take me a little while. I'm going to work through it because, like David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and, and done this evil in thy sight. He committed adultery and had the woman's husband killed to cover his sin by marrying her. But when it was done, he says, this was his prayer of repentance. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, God. Because every sin is not breaking some rule. Every sin is personal against God. And how can I want him to not say to me, now, now I know you, you, you want to be forgiven and eventually I'll, I'll work through this, eventually. Brother Wright, you're not being fair. No, you're the one not being fair. Because it says to do unto others as you want done to you. Talking to some folks here tonight. 
well, what if they keep doing it? Oh, okay. So you repented one time and you haven't had anything else to bring back to him, huh? As soon as you stop sinning, you can justify yourself not forgiving additional sins against you. I'm talking about what's hindering your faith. It's keeping your life and spirit open to fear. It's keeping your prayers from working and you having confidence your prayers are working. Brother Wright, this was supposed to be a holiday service. This doesn't fa- sound very celebratory. Oh, this is celebratory. Because I want you to have a different year in 2020. And when things get hard, if I look at the story of Job, when things get hard, that's because he has to dig that deep to find some stuff that he's trying to deal with that we won't acknowledge is there. Ooh, hallelujah. Hey, I'm not pointing a finger at you. And it, uh, Where do you think I learned this stuff at? <laughs> I didn't read this in some book. This is stuff I was taught. Mark 11, 24. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, then your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I understand. There's not a person in this room that hadn't been wronged at some time. There's not a person in this room that hadn't had people treat you wrong at some time. Not a person in this room. Every single one of us have been hurt. We've been wronged. The question is this. What's more important to you? Getting your sins forgiven? Or holding on to your grudge against the person that wronged you? You can't have it both ways. He's not going to put up with it. The audacity to come to him and ask him to forgive me for what I've done when I refuse to forgive somebody else? Go to Matthew 18 and find out how that works. It doesn't work. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. What proof of me? To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, To whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Why? Lest Satan get an advantage of us. For we're not ignorant of his devices. Oh, wait wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. How many times has somebody you care about, your friend, a loved one, your family member, come to you and told you what somebody else has done to them, and you take on their offense with them? Paul's telling us how to do this. I'm not going to, te- I'm going to, I'm going to stand with you and pray with you that God help you get over this because I'm not going to take your side in this and become bitter with you. I'm going to help you by forgiving that person with you in the person of Christ. Because you see, the same blood that was shed for my forgiveness was shed to enable you to forgive that person. And so in the person of Christ, I'm going to forgive them too. Because the most difficult offense to deal with is an inherited offense. The transferred offense. It's the most difficult to deal with. That's why... You got to be really careful 
who you call, who you appeal to, to feel sorry for you in what you're going through. Because if you transfer bitterness to them, and then God deals with you and you forgive, they don't do so easy with that. They don't. Transferred bitterness, transferred offense is the most difficult kind to forgive if you're not going to do it in the person of Christ because you're not the one that was offended. You're offended that the one you love has been offended. But they didn't do it to you. So God's going to deal with that person that was the victim. And they, if they're going to be saved, they're eventually going to forgive. But what do you do? How do you deal with it? Finally, Paul said this to Philemon. Chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 17. If that, it, Paul, uh, a man who was a runaway servant to Philemon, ended up in jail with Paul, and Paul converted him. Or well, the Lord converted him through Paul. So Paul is writing a letter because he's sending Philemon home, excuse me, uh, Onesimus or whatever his name was, sending him home to Philemon to make things right. So Paul is writing a letter to Philemon. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. You know what Paul said? If you're going to hold a grudge against him and not forgive them, then you're going to have to hold it against me and not forgive me. Because whatever he did to you, put it on my account. Hold me just as liable and responsible as you're holding him. Because I prayed him through. I saw his life change. God made him new. God made him different. And now he's, he's not a servant of yours. Now he's a brother. And if you don't like that, because you can't let go of what he did to you, then understand this, that our relationship is now in jeopardy because you put me in his category because I, that's my account too. You know what that's called? Love. Now, unrepented sins, unforgiven grudges, opens the door to what? Cares. The third hindrance or blockage to my relationship with God and effective ministry or cares. It's, I, after I, you talk about sin, sin's a horrible thing. Yes, sin's a horrible thing. Grudges are a horrible thing. Grudges are a horrible thing. Oh, and the same exact category as sins and grudges? Unrepented sins and unforgiven grudges? In the exact same category in God's mind is cares. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. I'm going to read several verses here quickly. Now it came to pass, as they went, that they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. She was, over, she was overweighed, uh, weighted down with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. But Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful. That means full of care. Not cautious, but full of care. And troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part that shall not, which shall not be taken away from her. Martha, you're living in fellowship with cares. Mary is living in fellowship with me. And you can't do both. Because the root word in the Greek of the word care means to distract, to divide. Your cares divide you from God. Just as surely as sin you won't repent of. Just as, sure as gr surely as grudges that you won't let go of. Your cares divide you from God. Why? Because cares are the ultimate, what you do with cares reveals whether you are an idolater or a child of God. Because if you hang on to your cares, you're playing God. And that's idolatry. Oh, 
holding on to your cares instead of casting them on Him and releasing them to Him is idolatry. Now you can't fellowship with God and be an idol worshiper. And the idol you're worshiping is yourself. Because a care is that which I hold on to because I want control to make sure this thing goes the way I want it to go rather than releasing it to him and said, okay, Father, whatever you, whatever you want to do, whatever's best here, I trust you. Mm. Luke 21, 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. That's overeating. <laughs> and drunkenness. That's uh, surfeiting is the stupor that comes to somebody that is so full they become lethargic. That was a good meal, but I can't move. Really? Lest any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness. Oh, and let's put another thing in that same category. Cares of this life. These things put great stress on your heart, both naturally and spiritually. Overeating, drunkenness, and cares. Well, you know, it's just my nature. I'm a worrier. Yes, it is your nature. It's your sinful nature. It is your sinful nature that you've been saved from. But I can't live, be separate from my sinful nature because I won't give up control because I don't trust the Father. And hear me. No matter how much He loves us, we cannot fellowship with Him if we hold on to cares. It's an insult to Him. Well, you know, the Lord's busy. I'm just going to hang on to this, try to make it go the way I want it to. Because if I give it to him, he may not make it go the way I want it to go. And I don't know. And I may not like that. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. That's exactly the test, isn't it? That is the test, isn't it? <laughs> How about Mark chapter 4, verse 18? And these are they which are, which are are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things enter in, choke the word, and they become unfruitful. There, look at the fellowship that cares keeps here. The deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things are equated with cares of this world. They're not innocent. Being overloaded with cares that you won't let go of and trust God with is not innocent. It's not okay. And it's keeping you from knowing Jesus because he has specifically addressed that in Luke chapter 11, which was the text tonight, or Matthew chapter 11, which was the text tonight. Come unto me, all ye that labor. Labor to do what? Make things go the way I want them to go. And are heavy laden. Heavy laden or weighted down with what? The cares that I want God to fix. Well, you know what? I just, I just love uh, my husband, my wife, my kids, my parents so much. I just can't, I just can't let go of this and trust God with it. I got to just keep on praying that God would save them. Because you don't ever trust Him with them. And you're the Savior of oh, God. Now, are there times that the Holy Ghost may move on you? That the Holy Ghost may shed tears through you, yes. But the feeling inside is completely different than this, this I've got this, I've got to save them. I, you do? Can I see your hands? You got any nail prints? Uh, can't do it. You can't save them. And you know what you do when you try to save them? When you try to save them, you drive them away. You create bitterness. Because they, they use you as a representation of Jesus. And the way you're treating them, they believe that's the way Jesus treats them. And so that becomes their excuse to stay like they are. Hallelujah, glory to God, thank you Jesus, amen. Amen. Okay, one more here quickly. 
I think you've heard this one before. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. How do I do that? By casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And so this is my parting word on this before I finalize with number four quickly. Everything you're holding on to, God becomes the adversary of it. Did you hear what I just said? Because I've got more than enough book to prove the statement. Whatever you hold on to demonstrates your pride. And God is the resistor of the proud. Whatever you're holding on to, whatever you won't give to Him, He becomes the enemy of it working out the way you want it to. He resists it. Why? Because your pride's going to cause you to be lost. True humility is not going, I'm just a, such a terrible person. That's pride talking. Inferiority and superiority are two sides of the exact same coin. When things are going your way, you're up. I'm the best there is. When things aren't going your way, you're down. I'm the worst there is. And you know what? you got to have a program to keep up with the flip-flops. Okay, today is... Okay, this is an update, so I can't talk to you because you know everything. And This is a down day, and I can't talk to you today because you're not going to listen to a thing i got to say because you're a horrible person. You're such a horrible person that there's no hope for you. Brother Wright, you're mocking me. Yes, I really am. I'm mocking your self-deception. I'm mocking your self-deception. Because the problem isn't God. It's not His unwillingness or inability to help you. It's your own pride that's not willing to do it His way. And the denial of the price you're paying for that. Because it's expensive to carry your cares. It's really expensive. He cares for you. That's, a good, that's good news. But He only cares when you give up your cares. What was it that, that Pastor Joel Wright said tonight? He would have walked right by them. They were in the middle of a storm. They were rowing hard because they were professional fishermen. That made them professional sailors. And He was just going to walk right on by. You're professional. You got this. You got it. You got it. How's that working out for you? You got it. How's that working out for you? Show me anybody that uses a few people with a bad attitude as an excuse to take a stand against separation. And I'll show you somebody that's offended because he said, be ye holy because I'm holy. And without holiness, no man shall see God. And a few people with a bad attitude being used as an excuse for you to live according to your flesh is proof of an unforgiven offense back there someplace. Hallelujah, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Finally. Now we get down to it, really, because this is ultimately what the problem is. Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out devils in thy name? And in thy name done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And what is iniquity? It's just simply doing my will and not the Father's. Here's, it, same, it, the same thing applies here as it does with sin and anything else. Okay, It's not sin that keeps me from God. It's not humbling myself and, re, and repenting and confessing those sins. In faith, sincerely. It's not grudges that keep me from God. It's holding on to Him, playing idol. I'm God. Vengeance is mine, saith me. Because it's idolatry. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So when I'm holding on to a grudge, I'm, that's idolatry. Because vengeance only belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you. 
Because all sin, no matter what's done to you, no matter what it is, all sin is ultimately against God, not you. Because to be a victim, you've first got to be innocent of never having done that to anybody else. So it's not sin that keeps me from God. It's unrepentant sin. It's not grudges that keep me from God. It's, it's unforgiving grudges. It's not cares that keep me from God. It's cares that I control and won't cast. And it's not my will that keeps me from God. And it's not even the struggle with my will that keeps me from God. It's me being unwilling to have my will broken and submitted to God that keeps me from God. There's a lot of verses here. I wish I had the time to go through them, but I do not. I'm going to read just a couple of them as I close out. John 9, 31. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. In that context, what is the sin that God that causes a person not to hear the sinner? Not doing the will of God. Matthew 21, 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he, said, and he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of them twain did, did the will of the, his father? They say also unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. It's not how you start that's the issue. God's not trying to save sinless people. God's not trying to save people that have never had a grudge. God's not trying to save people that have never had any cares they held on to. No, it's not how you start that's the issue. It's how you end up that's the issue. It's not the beginning that's the, that's the point. It's the ending that matters. That's what matters. That's why there's hope for every one of us. That's why there's hope for every one of us. My beginning doesn't determine my ending. It's how I end up that determines my ending. So Jesus said it this way. The scripture says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. And I don't have the verse in here, but it says, through sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. Why are you letting me go through this, God? Why are you letting me go through this? So you will have sorrow of heart. So your spirit will be broken. So that God can bless you and help you. He did this to me? No, he allowed it to happen. If you're a child of God, there's nothing that happens to you that he did not allow. He didn't cause it. He's not the instigator of it. Yes, he could have stopped it. No, he didn't stop it. Why? Because sorrow of heart breaks the spirit, breaks the will. That's why the scripture says, He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Because if there's not any suffering and no brokenness in me, then I'm not ever going to have deliverance from my sin and victory over my sin. Why would God allow all this stuff to happen? Because He loves you enough to try to save you. That's why. And if you're going to resent what He's done and what He's allowed to try to save you, then I don't know how much hope there is. I know this is strong, isn't it? No, it's not really. I've really toned it down tonight simply because there wasn't enough time to explain my stronger statements. But I'll get around to it. I'm closing out now. John 4.34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 5.30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. 
And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And in order to save you, he had to pray three times in the garden. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. To be able to save you, he had to have his own human will broken. And for you and I to be saved, our human will must be broken. That's why the book says, if you'd stand a moment. Again, we're going to have our business meeting in a moment. If you're a member of this church, I beg of you not to leave. If you're not a, a voting member of this church, you're welcome to stay. But I'm going to say it one more time here. Okay? All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are, who are called according to His purpose. Life is not easy. It's not. It wasn't designed to be easy. Life is designed to break me and break me and break me again because he cannot save the unbroken. I have a choice and you have a choice. I can choose by the grace of God to fall on the rock and be broken or, or I can force him to love me enough to let the rock fall on me and grind my will to powder. You don't have a third option except to be lost. I'll say that one more time. You don't have a third option except to be lost. Father, you have given me this word, and by your grace I have spoken what you've given me, not adding to or taking away from it. I commit this word into our hearts, our minds, our spirits, because... Lord, I can't do anything here, but you can do all things. I trust you with this word. It was your word, not mine. And you've spoken it because you love every one of us so much. Because you want to have a relationship with us more than we could ever imagine. I trust you, Father, to cause this word to work in our hearts and lives. So that we can walk with you the way you would have us to walk in 2020. That we might see you do all those things through us that you desire to do, that you plan to do, that you may be able to give us all things that you want to give us because we are broken before you, because we are submitted and surrendered to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, I loose the spirit of the love of God and the spirit of the grace of God upon every person in this room and every person that is hearing this message or will hear this message that you might be able to receive His grace and His empowerment to do what you absolutely cannot do yourself. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Itaha Soko la Bahaya, Ilorobo Kosakahaya Dere Kahaya. In the name of Jesus.